these are the students so welcome who are to the here. sixth annual Harvard Yenjing Institute Roundtable. I'm Liz Perry, the director of the Harvard Yenjing Institute. And these roundtables offer an opportunity to hear the views of scholars based in Asia, as well as uh, the Harvard faculty, on issues of pressing concern to Asia. Today, our roundtable is on civil society in East Asia. And as I think most of you know, originally we had been planning this roundtable as a commentary on uh, a talk and address by Taiwan's Minister of Culture, uh, Long Yingtai. Um, but, uh, and Long Yingtai herself, of course, is a highly respected scholar as well as a public critic. But unfortunately, uh, a week or so ago, she wrote us that due to the uh, current political turmoil in Taiwan, uh, she had been, in effect, grounded in Taipei and was unable to join us and uh, unable to deliver the talk that she had quite presciently uh, entitled Taiwan's Bumpy Road to Freedom, <laughs> Challenges to a Civil Society in the Making. As the title of Dr. Long's talk indicated, and as recent events in Taiwan confirm, this is indeed a bumpy road. Mm -hmm. Protesters who oppose the agreement in uh, uh, services, trade services between Taiwan and the PRC occupied the legislative yuan, the Lifa yuan, and then yesterday uh, stormed the executive uh, yuan, the Xinjiang yuan. And uh, according to this morning's New York Times, in that confrontation outside the Xinjiang Yan, some 174 people were injured, uh, including 119 police officers. Student groups and other NGOs in Taiwan have called for work and student strikes uh, all across the island to protest this trade agreement with the PRC. So it's indeed unfortunate that Dr. Long cannot be with us today, but I think her very absence underscores the importance and the challenge of a rising civil society. The challenges presented by rising civil society are not limited to Taiwan. They can be seen in other parts of East Asia as well. A couple of years ago, I gave uh, a talk in Seoul at a conference uh, organized at Korea University on the topic of building civil societies in new democracies, the challenge of liberalization. And uh, that talk, which I entitled The Illiberal Challenge of Authoritarian China, uh, and which was later published in the Taiwan uh, Journal of Democracy, gave me an opportunity uh, to argue that the relationship between civil society and democracy is not always simple and uh, straightforward. And I'd like to uh, share with you at the beginning here just a little bit from that piece entitled The Illiberal Challenge of Authoritarian China. It's, uh, from my point of view, a somewhat pessimistic piece. And my guess is that members of the panel may not entirely agree with it. Uh, Perhaps particularly Professor Gao may not agree with it. Um, he's, I think, much more optimistic uh, about Chinese civil society. Um, but let me um, just uh, spend a couple of minutes uh, spelling out that argument. As uh, we all know, a vibrant civil society and a participatory public are usually assumed to be fundamental pillars of democratization. Um, but I suggest that the experience of contemporary China may challenge this simple assumption. And if the liberal uh, challenge uh, for new democracies lies in building a strong civil society to strengthen these new democracies and to decrease the chances that they will fall back into authoritarianism, then China, I believe, presents uh, an illiberal challenge uh, that of an authoritarian state where a rising civil society accompanied by a huge surge in popular protest seems less conducive to democratization than to authoritarian resilience. Now, to be sure, China is not the only uh, challenge to a theory linking civil society and democratization. 
15 years ago, the political scientist Sherry Berman wrote uh, in a very well-known article in World Politics that a strong civil society in interwar Germany worked not to support German democracy, but rather to subvert German democracy. As uh, Berman wrote, quote, a robust civil society actually helped to scuttle the 20th century's most critical democratic experiment. Weimar Germany during the interwar period, uh, and during that period, Germans threw themselves into their clubs, their voluntary associations, their professional organizations, out of frustration with the failures of the national government and political parties, thereby helping to undermine the Weimar Republic and to facilitate Hitler's rise to power. Had German civil society been weaker, Berman argues, the Nazis would not have been able to capture so many citizens for their cause. Now, Berman's argument is that strong and responsive political institutions, governments and political parties in particular, are necessary uh, for civil society to have the positive beneficial effects uh, that uh, people like our colleague Bob uh, Putnam uh, argue for. In Weimar Germany, she tells us, the absence of these kinds of political institutions, strong, responsive governments and parties, uh, uh, allowed civil society to play an illiberal rather than a liberal role. And I think a similar argument might be made about interwar Japan. And here I suspect Professor Kage may disagree with me as well, uh, and that's fine too. Uh, under Taisho democracy, following the First World War, Japanese intellectuals and journalists uh, who were bolstered by labor unions and who were inspired by a variety of Western ideologies joined public associations and mounted large but orderly street demonstrations in favor of universal suffrage. But as in Weimar Germany, so also in Taisho Japan, a rising civil society became quite critical of the weakness and the unresponsiveness of Japanese government institutions, especially after the devastating uh, earthquake, the Kanto earthquake of 1923, when the Japanese state proved unable to provide an adequate response to the crisis, leaving the major relief work to uh, Buddhist charities and other non-government organizations. And it was in this situation of an awakened civil society that Japanese militarism gained ground. Now, contemporary China obviously is very different from Weimar Germany or Taisho Japan. The People's Republic of China doesn't lack for strong political institutions. By almost any measure, the government and the Communist Party of China are strong institutions. And in some respects, these are also quite responsive institutions. The Chinese government is constantly trying to gauge public opinion, not only for the purpose of suppressing dissent, but also for addressing public grievances and demands with new programs and new policies. So under these circumstances of strong and responsive institutions, the growth of civil society and popular protest in China serves not to weaken a new democracy, as was the case in Germany or Japan in the interwar period. It serves, I believe, rather to stifle democratization by strengthening an existing authoritarian state. The argument that a strong and rising civil society in China may work to strengthen the Chinese communist state is not original with me. It's an argument that the Chinese Ministry of Civil Affairs routinely makes. Ministry officials often credit intermediate associations in China with helping to reduce the burden on the state by providing valuable public goods. In China, of course, many NGOs are actually gangos or government-organized NGOs, which work closely with the state uh, and its agents. A prominent example is Project HOPE, which uh, was organized by the Communist Youth League and which brings new schools and teachers to some of the poorest regions of China, which also partners with the Ministry of Health to combat HIV AIDS and so forth. Uh, 
in China, uh, volunteers for Project Hope and for many other uh, nonprofit service groups accelerated markedly after the Wenchuan uh, earthquake of 2008 by relieving a strong but certainly not omnipotent state uh, of some of the responsibility for supplying goods and services. These associations help to reduce disappointment and uh, anger that might otherwise be directed at the state itself. So in conclusion, uh, I uh, argue in this piece that the case of China suggests that we may need uh, to further revise the common assumption linking civil society and democracy to recognize that a rise in associational activity and popular protest is not only no guarantee against a reversal from democracy, as uh, Sherry Berman argued, but under certain circumstances, a robust civil society may actually work to strengthen and to sustain a non-democratic regime. And that, I would submit, is the, Ill the uh, illiberal challenge of authoritarian China. Um, so I present that uh, as one possible take on civil society in East Asia, as I said, a rather um, dark one, perhaps. And my guess is that the panelists uh, who will be speaking after me will present more uh, cheerful ones for your consideration, although maybe I'll be incorrect about that. We have uh, a terrific lineup today of uh, panelists, and um, I'll uh, uh, introduce uh, each of them uh, very briefly. The first uh, to speak will be uh, Professor Kage Dieko of uh, the University of Tokyo. Um, professor Kage is Associate Professor of Political Science at uh, Todai, and her research focuses on civil society and participation uh, in uh, Japan in particular. She's the author of a book that came out from Cambridge University Press a couple of years ago entitled Civic Engagement in Postwar Japan, the Revival of a Defeated uh, Society. And uh, when my colleague, Professor Susan Farr, uh, suggested uh, to me that I might invite Professor Kage to uh, speak, uh, I was very pleased as I looked up her publications and so on, but even more pleased as I got in touch with her and she told me that she was thrilled uh, to come back because not only does she have her PhD from Harvard University, but um, that PhD, she tells me, was funded in part by a fellowship from the Harvard Yanjing Institute. Uh, so I'm particularly pleased to welcome uh, her back. And uh, next to her, the next speaker will be uh, Professor Chung Jong Ho of uh, Seoul National University. He is an anthropologist with his PhD from Yale University. He is currently Vice President for International Affairs at Seoul National University. Um, he uh, also has a connection to the Harvard Yanjing Institute. He's a former visiting scholar at the Institute. He's written widely on civil society in China, particularly the um, uh, Zhejiang Cun, the Zhejiang village in Beijing of migrants uh, from uh, the province of uh, Zhejiang. But he tells me that he's going to speak today about civil society in Korea, since he is the lone Korean uh, on our panel. Uh, following uh, Professor Chung, we will have comments by Professor Gao Bing Zhong, who is a uh, professor of anthropology in the Department of Sociology at Peking University and also director of the Center for uh, the Study of Civil Society at Peking University. At the same time, he's vice president of China's Folklore Society. He's a member of the Committee for Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage, part of the Ministry of Culture in the PRC. And he, too, is a former visiting scholar at the Harvard Yanjing Institute. He was here uh, in 2010 to 2011 and is the author of a book entitled Folk Culture and Civil Society, Cultural Studies of Modern processes in China. And then finally, uh, we will have Dr. Marshall Gantz, Gantz uh, of the Kennedy School. Uh, Marshall, in the bio that I received on him, is proud 
to point out that he was an undergraduate at Harvard University. Uh, he entered in 1960, but rather than graduating uh, four years uh, later, um, a year before graduation, he um, started perhaps what has subsequently become a rather uh, illustrious uh, habit of Harvard dropouts uh, who then <laughs> go on uh, to make quite a name uh, for themselves. Uh, but unlike Bill Gates or uh, Mark Zuckerberg and so on, um, <laughs> Marshall uh, did not go off uh, to found uh, some billion dollar uh, plus enterprise. Instead, he left to volunteer as a civil rights organizer in Mississippi. Uh, he subsequently joined uh, Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers and over the subsequent years gained uh, experience in union and uh, community organizing. He later returned uh, to Harvard, not only finished his undergraduate uh, degree, but also finished a PhD uh, in sociology uh, and currently teaches in uh, the Kennedy School, teaches in particular about leadership, organizing, and civil society. And uh, quite recently, Marshall has had experience both in China and in Japan uh, directing workshops on civil society organization. And so I thought it would be particularly uh, instructive to uh, listen to his impressions about civil society uh, and the differences uh, he may have encountered in uh, the civil society training that he led in China and Japan. So first of all, we will turn to Professor Kage, and uh, please join me in welcoming her.